uh, hey, thank you everyone for uh, such a, a nice participation in ES Week. Our sessions, uh, session attendance uh, this year has been one of the best. Uh, uh, and uh, so this today is the final day of ES Week. And we have, uh, we are very fortunate to have keynote from Dr. Martinosi. And after this, we will have a awards, best paper and other awards session uh, that is for half an hour. And then we have our uh, traditional ES Week panel. Uh, the ES Week panel is on uh, wafer scale computing. Uh, that uh, should be very interesting and controversial. So please uh, hang on to attend that. So let me introduce Dr. Martinosi. Um, uh, Dr. Martinosi or Margaret Martinosi leads the US National Science Foundation's NSF Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering, SICE. With an annual budget of more than $1 billion, the SICE Directorate at NSF has the mission to uphold the nation's leadership in scientific discovery and engineering innovation through its support of fundamental research and education in computer and information science and engineering, as well as transformative advances in research cyber infrastructure. While at NSF, Dr. Martinosi is on leave from Princeton University, where she is the Hugh Trumbull Adams 35 Professor of Computer Science. Dr. Martinosi's research interests are in computer architecture and hardware software interface issues in both classical and quantum computing systems. Dr. Martinosi is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is a fellow of the Association for Computer, Computing Machinery, ACM, and the Institute of Electrical, Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE. Uh, thanks very much for the kind introduction, and thank you all for joining me, uh, whatever time of day it is, where you are. Good morning and good evening. Um, it's wonderful to get the chance to speak here today. Um, as you heard in the introduction, I wear two hats right now. So I'm speaking on behalf of the U.S. National Science Foundation. Um, I lead the Computer and Information Science and Engineering, or SCIES, directorate here at the NSF. Um, but the people who typically serve in this position typically do so as a four-year rotation in from the research community. And so while I'm at NSF, I'm on leave from Princeton University, where I've been a faculty member for many years, and I work on computer architecture. And over the years, I have, um, and my students have, attended and presented papers at ES Week. So it's wonderful to be back, albeit in this virtual form. Uh, so I'm going to give a, a bit of an overview on uh, some of the topics that are important to us all and a bit of thoughts on how um, NSF as a funding agency approaches them. So with that, uh, here we go. So the National Science Foundation is a United States federal agency. It was formed uh, in 1950 to be the nation's all of science, basic science research agency. And so it has this full mission to promote the progress of science, but also to ad advance national health, prosperity and welfare and so forth. Uh, so where other federal agencies give out funding that is quite focused in its mission, for example, we have a National Institute of Health that focuses on human health research. NSF's mission is broad to invest in a wide range of categories from astronomy to zoology and everything in between. And we do so by uh, offering research funding awards to the research community. There's no research that happens at NSF per se, but we steward it out for the community. So the way that NSF supports this broad mission is through a set of directorates and offices. And you can see this honeycomb of them here. Uh, the basic idea here uh, is that we cover the full space. Uh, there's tons of interactions and intersections between this top, these topic areas. And you can see where computer and information science and engineering or size sits in this landscape. So these are some of them. Uh, but actually, in addition to what I would call the original topical directorates, there are also uh, cross-cutting uh, or 
integrative activities, uh, such as our Office of Integrative Activities, our Office of International Science and Engineering, and most recently, our Directorate for Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships. And so these crosscuts weave together with the more topically focused uh, directorates to cover the space well and to advance on a range of both uh, disciplinary and interdisciplinary topics. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot today about, I, I chose, you know, when I was thinking about what to spend my time on today, I chose to focus a lot on the sort of semiconductors and microelectronics part of the space, in part because of um, how much that has been a part of the conversation uh, in terms of U.S. research funding this year. Uh, and so these offices and directorates that you see highlighted are the ones that are particularly engaging on the semiconductor and microelectronics space. With that, uh, let me give you an overview of NSF by the numbers. Uh, this is what we look like as, a, as an agency as a whole. Our budget uh, in fiscal year 22, which just ended a couple of weeks ago, uh, was just under $9 billion. And as I said, we don't do research ourselves. We do a merit review process and, uh, and award research awards out to the community. And so in pursuit of that, we have received 40, nearly 44,000 awards, um, of which we fund about a quarter of them. Uh, sorry, we received around 44,000 proposals of which we fund about a quarter of them. You can see the huge scale. Over 300,000 people are supported by NSF as a whole and over 250 NSF Nobel, NSF funded Nobel Prize winners over the years. I'll show you some Turing Award winners in a second. This 253 is, I believe, two or three out of date because of last week's announcements. Should be, I think, closer to 255 or 256 now. So if we zoom in on my directorate, the size directorate, what does that look like? Size had an enacted budget of $1 billion. Um, and received around uh, a little over 7,000 proposals. And we too had a funding rate of around 24%. So we make about 1,700 to 2,000 awards a year. Where does that go? That goes out to nearly 400 different universities in the country, um, as well as nonprofits. We fund around 20,000 people from faculty, postdocs, graduate students, undergrads, um, and even a few high schoolers. Uh, I think one of the most interesting facts for people to hear about is the fact that the U.S. National Science Fund Foundation funds about 80% of the federally funded CS research that happens in academic institutions in the U.S. So um, for those of you who are professors or graduate students, um, I like to joke that um, for a lot of you, maybe 80% of you, I pay a bit of your salary. And in return, uh, what we're thrilled about, what we're proud of, um, is the kind of amazing impact that the work has had over the years. I'll also note that, you know, this 373 institutions, what does this include? Um, there are different levels of sort of research intensity uh, to, to institutions. Um, there's a Carnegie classification system that many U.S. institutions are a part of. A Carnegie R1 institution are the roughly 150 most uh, research capable universities in America. We fund all of those, uh, but that leaves another 220 other institutions that we fund, which might be uh, undergrad focused colleges, two year colleges, and so forth. So, the way I like to speak to what NSF seeks to do is using a metaphor. Um, and in particular, the metaphor is one that many cultures use, uh, namely that one generation plants the trees for the next generation to benefit. And uh, we see this throughout NSF. This picture here is actually a tree in my backyard, um, in my home. My husband and I love this tree, but we have no idea who planted it. And research is like that too. When you start a new paper, when you start working with a new student, when you write a proposal uh, to whatever funding agency you, you work on, when you if you're in industry, when you advocate for a project idea to your managers, these are all acts of planting trees in the hopes that a few years down the road, there'll be some benefits, there'll be some shade, there'll be some beauty, there'll be some oxygen produced, right? This is what we do at NSF too. We try to make sure the right trees get planted at scale with a rich diversity of, in this case, research ideas. 
So with that as kind of the metaphor, uh, let's talk about uh, sort of some examples of trees that have gotten uh, uh, planted, some impacts that we've had. There's different types of impacts. One type of impact you could call foundational impact, and that's the degree to which NSF funded and size funded research has really um, led the world in fundamental changes, uh, fundamental improvements in how information is gathered, analyzed, and communicated. This picture here is a picture was the, the first time a black hole uh, was imaged. Uh, it looks like astronomy perhaps, uh, but under the covers, there's a lot of computing in there. And in fact, one of the computer science professors who uh, helped make these images possible at this resolution um, received her early career award um, from NSF size. And we're really proud of the connection that we have uh, to a wide range of topic areas. As I mentioned, um, I mentioned the Nobel Prize winners on a previous slide. Here's the, uh, here's the numbers for Turing awardees. Roughly two thirds of them have received NSF funding. So given that the Turing Award is an international award, not everyone uh, is in the US to apply for NSF funding. And given that it's an award that goes both to academics and to industry, and industry folks tend not to ask NSF for funding, um, it's remarkable that two thirds have received NSF funding. And this is a legacy we are extremely proud of because of the foundational contributions to the world that uh, those Turing awardees represent. Uh, so that's foundational. Translational refers to the notion of getting research from the lab out into the world. How do we translate? How do we have broad impact from our discoveries? This picture, there's no way you can read it in this, uh, in this size, in this scale, um, but I'd recommend that you go look at this link uh, for more information. Uh, there is a report uh, that was originally generated in about 20 years ago. It's come to be called the tire tracks report because of how these stripes over here look like the skid marks of a tire. This tire tracks report is something that gets updated about every four years. And it's intended to show the flow of results from early stage research out to companies, out to real world impact. And so I won't, um, be able to take you through this in detail, but know that each one of these little stripes is a different topic area, including things like computer systems and computer architecture that are very much a part of ES Week. Uh, each stripe uh, has these arrows that you can see, and those arrows correspond to seminal results uh, that uh, went from research to uh, development to products over time. Uh, with the timeline being uh, from 1960 to, to 2020. Uh, so if you have the chance to take a look at this in detail, what you'll see is this incredible, rich uprising of results that come out of the research community from all of you and then uh, feed into subsequent results in uh, impacts in products and and real world usage. You see the swooping arrows that go between topic areas showing how maybe a result from formal methods gets used in systems or maybe a result from HCI gets used in products as well. You can see uh, topics like AI that actually have pretty long timelines between um, seminal results when they were you know, in the so-called AI winters. And you see other fields uh, like computer architecture and com computer systems where there's a very quick uptake from our research community into products. So that's the left-hand side of this diagram. The middle part of this diagram are a set of companies that um, have come to the National Academies to the study committee and said, yes, we use these technologies. And you can see the sort of broad swath of uptake for these technologies. The right-hand side goes from the computing companies, which are the Qualcomm's, the Apple's and so forth, and goes out to this broader space here of what they call IT transform sectors. That's agriculture, that's health technology, that's entertainment like the NFL, all, all saying that computing technology, information technology has impacted them. So by the time you get from sort of 1960 over here to this broad swath of different technology areas on the right, you're talking about over a trillion dollars of economic impact from the work that we all do. And that's a real point of pride. Um, and last, there are societal impacts as well. Size-funded research is benefiting communities by changing who engages in computing, and that's important too. 
So when I speak about size as a topic area, and this is computer and information science and engineering, uh, I speak about it in terms of three broad organizational themes. These are not intended to be narrow pathways that people are supposed to stay on like balance beams, but rather these are intended to be broad organizational umbrellas that many people will find themselves underneath once, twice, three times. Uh, so let's talk through each of them a little bit. Uh, the first one is really um, very much relevant to ES suite. And it's basically the degree to which the end of Denard's scaling and the slowing of Moore's law uh, is impacting our field as a whole. It's not just impacting the transistors and the circuits down low, but it's impacting all aspects of computing, hardware, software, it's percolating up through the layers. Uh, computer security is affected because as the hardware software interface changes, our ability to verify things appropriately has, has changed. Reliability has changed. And finally, if you think about it, many of us are of an age where our curriculum was based on layers. Uh, but now, as we've changed Moore's law, there's a seismic shift in those errors. And so the curriculums are, are needing to change as well. Um, so I'll talk a lot more about this one in today's talk, but let's go through the other two themes as well. Um, AI, uh, how could I not talk about AI, right? So AI today, is not just a subtopic area of computing that draws from sort of the algorithmic side, but it's really, it's, it's drawing from an all of size inflection point. Algorithms, data, and systems have all come together to bring AI to where it is. And then likewise, AI is broadly impacting and fueling advances across not just our field, but many fields and across society as a whole. The, the third theme tends uh, sometimes to surprise folks, but I, I think, uh, Designing beneficial socio-technical systems, this theme is, is intended to acknowledge, uh, first of all, our field has been socio-technical from the start. If you look at early computer systems, uh, you know, they were, they were designed for things like computing missile trajectories. There was a, a deep social impact to what our systems have been doing from the beginning of our field. Um, and I think now we're in a time of reckoning where we're asking not just can we do this with our technology, but should we do this with our technology? And so more so than ever, our field is being shaped by both the perspective of our technologies, but also by perspectives on how humans will use them and how humans will be affected by them. And so weaving in a notion of designing beneficial socio-technical systems is important. This is broad. Uh, for those of you who are embedded systems folks, this could mean designing systems that um, that have more sustainable energy and carbon footprints, right? Uh, and avoid e-waste. For other folks at some other part of the uh, topic space, this might mean thinking about connectivity for rural regions that where the ability to have sort of high bandwidth connectivity to the rest of the internet can mean frankly, a life or death, death difference in terms of economic and educational uh, accessibility, and so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of different ways in which our systems uh, can be beneficial uh, to society, and this, is, this theme is about thinking through those ways. So I wanted to zoom in on this notion of next generation computing, semiconductor, and microelectronics workforce in more detail. And I think, you know, for some of you, if you are working in the US, I'm gonna give you some examples of programs, frankly, that you can go ahead and propose to. For others of you who are not working in the US, uh, there might be opportunities for international collaborate, collaboration grants into some NSF programs. Um, but for all of you, the goal is to give a sense of how we approach uh, funding for these topic areas, how we try to cover the space with the limited budget that we have. So, uh, in terms of our funding approaches, uh, I sort of broke it into these different segments that you see here. There's things that we call core research investments. Uh, and that, so there's things we call core research investments. There's things we call cross-cutting programs, which span across directorates. Um, but there's also things like research resources and infrastructure. What are the lab or the physical equipment? Equipment items that we need to get the work done. And then finally, we fund things that relate to education and workforce. Who are the people that we want to engage in this? 
Uh, so when it comes to core research investments, you can think about that as NSF has a steady flow of um, funding availability for anyone in the community to come in with proposals on essentially any topic area within the scope of the agency. And those core research investments, I view them, to, use, to go back to the tree analogy, I view those as the acorns, right? They are the seeds, the pine cones, the seeds by which we're going to plant those big trees. They're early on. These are not large awards, but they are very helpful awards that allow a professor and a graduate student to work on an idea for three to five years in order to make progress, in order to get a lot of interesting and important trees planted, get those ideas um, to germinate. So uh, in terms of the named programs part of this space, I think one of the things that I that we're all particularly proud of and excited about is a new program called the Future of Semiconductors. This is something that several directorates at NSF are running together. So my directorate is Computer and Information Science and Engineering. Uh, our partner directorates here are the Engineering Directorate the Math and Physical Sciences Directorate, where material science happens, and the Technology Innovation and Partnerships Directorate. So you can, from the names of those directorates, you can get a sense that this is across the full computing, communications, electronics, and materials stack. And the goal of FUSE is to encourage uh, teaming across different topic areas. So if you're a computer person and you have an idea um, for how to make use of a new kind of materials technology, this is the perfect place for you to explore those kinds of ideas. What are the systems implications of a particular novel material? A great example might be something like DNA storage. What do you do differently in a computer system if DNA storage becomes available to you at scale? And so on and so on. Um, another program in this area that size funds uh, is the Principles and Practice of Scalable Systems program. And um, this really gets to that notion of uh, the seismic shift that I mentioned before. So uh, I always use uh, the picture that you can see here when I, when I talk about this program. And you might be wondering, why is this picture here? Uh, this is a picture of a region in the US American West called uh, the Water Pocket Fold region of Utah, the state of Utah. and uh, the idea of this region, there's plenty of these elsewhere in the world, but the idea of this picture is that there were many sedimentary layers that were horizontal originally when they were laid down, but then because of a seismic shift, they got tilted to the side. And you can see that there's nearly a, a 90 degree shift there. This is, <laughs> this is the mental picture that I have when I think about that seismic shift that we're going through at the end of Moore's Law. We have these traditional layers that we have leaned on for a long time. In, in sort of the transistor circuits, microarchitecture, architecture, uh, compilers, operating systems, programming languages, and so forth. These are the layers that are familiar to many of us who are sort of over a certain age. But things are changing. Actually, I think the embedded systems community that you folks represent has really been a, an important set of leaders in rethinking these changes because embedded systems are a place where you have been more open to rethinking changes uh, out in front of maybe some of the other more traditional parts of the space. Uh, so this program invites people to come in with expertise at these different layers and work together. So the idea is you can't come in just at one layer and say, I'm gonna be a transistors person, not for this program, there are other programs, but for this program, you come in with three friends who are gonna cover the area well, uh, maybe an applications person, a programming languages person, uh, a, a sort of systems or architecture person and a technology person. And you get funded together to work on a slice that goes through those traditional er uh, layers. So we've offered this funding for several years now. In the first couple of years, uh, we saw some very interesting examples of these multi-layer teams one around accelerating genomics, one around accelerating formal verification, and the next deadlines are uh, in January, uh, coming up in a few months. Uh, another area where this end of Moore's Law set of issues um, it is really of interest to you and frankly, uh, to many of us, 
and that's the area of sustainability uh, writ large. So we view this as two arrows that it, it, there's a set of bi-directional issues. On the one hand, there's sustainability in computing, which is the left-hand side of this diagram. That's about cleaning up our own house. That's about making computing itself more environmentally friendly. Um, and that's about having sustainability, not just power efficiency as a first order metric in systems design. So if you know me, you know that I worked on power efficiency in computer systems for many years. It's very important to me. But now what, what many people have sort of persuaded me of is that's not enough. We have to think about the full life cycle from design to manufacturing to e-waste. And when you're in the embedded systems world as you are, this notion of the full life cycle of what these embedded sensors are going to do, what these embedded systems are going to do, where's the battery, uh, how does all of this play out in terms of sustainability, this all comes together. That's what the left-hand side arrow is about. The right-hand side arrow is something different. The right-hand side arrow says, yes, we have carbon footprint issues in computing. Nonetheless, there are many opportunities to use computing techniques to improve sustainability. And we have a range of different examples of this. So cyber physical systems and internet of things systems that are out there in the world, improving aspects of agriculture, uh, food security. Uh, improving logistics. The fact that I am using a computer system to Zoom with you today instead of flying somewhere to speak in person is an example of using computing and communications to improve sustainability in the sense that I saved the carbon footprint of a plane ride. So these two come together and we have a range of different investments that NSF makes um, across both of these directions. Uh, we actually, uh, this past year, uh, offered what's called a Dear Colleague Letter, or DCL, on Design for Sustainability in Computing. Uh, and the idea here was to invite in this kind of fundamentally new and disruptive research on the left-hand side in all aspects. So full life cycle design and everything from uh, uh, software and user interfaces down to the technology and everything from uh, mobile edge devices to high performance computing. So we invited this and we got a very robust response and we were able to fund a small set of projects uh, as our starter awards uh, in this particular response. And you can see how those map out across different topic areas, including things like sustainable reuse of computing, sustainable disposal, repurposing smartphones, and so forth. So this was really an all of computing response to the opportunities around sustainability. And this is just the beginning. Uh, this was a response to a modest dear colleague letter that we issued, but the goal is to, to uh, budget, permit, budget permitting to go bigger in future years because of the importance of this area. Uh, onward, so in other parts of NSF, um, NSF participates in uh, the Materials Genome Initiative, which is a way to design new materials. Um, and it has an interesting method of actually bringing together uh, different research groups, building off of uh, each other's data. And increasingly, we're seeing AI and computer systems researchers playing a role in programs like DMREF in order to advance the kinds of um, it, research that's underpinning these materials development efforts. So I've talked my way through core research investments and cross-cutting. I now want to switch gears a little bit and talk about research resources and infrastructure. And I think everyone who's ever done research um, knows that it's not enough to have a good idea. It's not enough to have a good idea and some good collaborators. It's not enough to have a good idea, some good collaborators. Uh, and some research funding to keep everyone paid, you need the right resources to advance on your ideas. And that could be uh, data. It could be fab technology and so forth. So I'm going to step through some of the ways in which NSF is always seeking to pair research resources and infrastructure with the funding that we give out. Uh, so one thing that we uh, have built out over the past few months is an opportunity for all 
NSF funded researchers to fabricate chip prototypes as part of their research. And the idea of this is we know that when you start down a research path, you may not actually um, be sure of whether you're going to want to fabricate your ideas or not. But as you get a year or two in, that's when you tend to know, oh, this is a good one. This is worth fabbing. And so the idea is that we've offered, uh, again, these are more of these dear colleague letters. We've communicated to the community the opportunity to get an add-on supplement. If you have NSF funding that pertains to something related to your whole field of embedded systems, and you say, I want to fab a chip that's based on this work, uh, there's a mechanism by which uh, if you're a US-based researcher, that's possible. And the goal of this, I'm, sh I'm sharing this for a couple of reasons. One is if you are a US-based researcher, I hope you will make use of this or get the word out about it. Um, but more broadly, I think it is uh, sort of uh, heads up for the whole worldwide scientific community that we see it as, as important to not just simulate our ideas, but to actually fab real prototypes. And I think I come out of a community, the architecture community that has uh, leaned heavily on the quantitative approach and leaned heavily therefore on simulation. Um, but it's always nice when you can augment simulation with other types of assessments, including real world fab prototypes. And so this is about helping that kind of experimentalism um, be broadly accessible to everyone in the research community. So this was about fabbing chip prototypes in good old silicon, um, but obviously we're moving towards new types of technologies and there's opportunities to experiment there as well. And so an example of how we're approaching um, research resources and infrastructure for quantum uh, computing is this dear colleague letter, um, which offers additional funding for NSF researchers who want to get quantum computing platform access for NSF re uh, to make use of cloud connected uh, quantum resources. And there's three companies that are listed here. Uh, but I think one of the things that I want to highlight is if you look at the different resources that are available through these three, it gets out to more like a dozen different uh, quantum computing prototypes from a range of other companies, including D-Wave, including INQ, and so forth. So there's much more available than the three that are listed here. So that's another way in which we're saying, here's an interesting topic area, quantum, and here's our way of helping a broad set of researchers access resources related to that topic area. Um, we also uh, have the ability for uh, uh, US-based researchers to write proposals to create infrastructure. So if there is a piece of infrastructure, a national resource uh, that you wish existed, you can write a proposal to make it exist. And you can see some of the opportunities for that here. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm gonna shift gears once again, and I'm gonna talk about education and workforce a little bit. Um, we have a range of efforts at NSF that are intended to fund uh, different ways of increasing different parts of the computer systems and semiconductor workforce writ large uh, at different levels. So this particular effort that I have screenshotted here is actually about folks from uh, two-year uh, degree programs, what we would call community colleges in the US and their ability to engage in topic areas like this. This one is about research experiences for undergraduates. So we have a set of opportunities where undergraduates can get a small amount of funding to spend the summer doing research in a lab rather than spending the summer at a com company internship. Uh, so basically to make sure that they get to see a broad set of possible experiences before they make the choice about what's next for them after they graduate. And then also at the undergrad level, we have opportunities for faculty members to say, hey, as we go through this end of Moore's Law, there's an awful lot that's changing in our curriculum, and we need to re-envision that computing curriculum to, to um, account for that. And so we have opportunities for folks to write proposals 
um, to get support towards updating their undergraduate curricula, for example, to account for that seismic shift at the end of Moore's Law that we've talked about today. Uh, and this is another different type of curriculum award. And then finally, this is a fellowship program that we offer uh, for students who have been out in industry and who want to come back into graduate school for them to consider uh, coming back into some of these workforce pathways. So I'll close with this to give you a sense of the scale for NSF as a whole. Um, it's been a really interesting and rewarding experience for me to come from the research community in and to essentially say thank you. NSF supported my research career uh, since 1986 when I received a fellowship from NSF. So, so that's an awful lot of uh, gratitude that I have now to pay back. Um, and I realized that this is an international audience. And so some of what I've talked about was with the intent of helping US-based researchers know what's available. But most of what I talked about was just to give a sense of how do we approach this? How do we think about covering the whole space, uh, research, uh, development, research resources, and people as broadly as possible? Because for us to be well off as a world 10, 20, 50 years from now, uh, we're all going to need to engage in this. And so this is a bit about how we're approaching it um, from, from this perch. And so with that, uh, thanks very much. If you have questions, I think the best place is if you can put them into the Q&A field, and then uh, happy to field them there. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hey, thank you for uh, the wonderful talk. And I really love the tree in your back backyard. That is amazing. Uh, let me see. So to all the attendees and uh, panelists, uh, please feel free to uh, ask questions. There are two modes to ask questions. One is you can write your questions in the Q&A in Zoom, or you can just raise your hand and I will find you and <laughs> you'll be able to ask the question in your voice. Uh, okay, so actually we already have one question. Uh, Professor Martinosi, would you please comment on what will be new interesting areas after AI? Uh, sure, so uh, after AI is, a, is, is, it makes me chuckle a little bit because uh, I don't think AI is going to end necessarily. I think AI is a tool in our toolkit and we'll be using it um, both to sort of create foundational advances in how we um, analyze information, but also we'll be using it, applying it out to many different topic areas in our world, right? So it'll be in um, different systems that we use every day. It will also, I think, make very fundamental changes in how we do science. So I, I think one of the interesting areas for me is how can computational techniques like AI change the nature of science in 10 or 20 or 30 years? So for example, um, when many of us were in school, we learned about a scientific method, right? In which you have a hypothesis and then you do an experiment to test that hypothesis. Well. AI basically could be helping us to generate the hypotheses, to automate the generation of interesting hypotheses, not simply to analyze the data at the end. And so I think, uh, so, so first of all, I, I think uh, we're still seeing uh, a very nascent phase of where AI might weave itself into our world. Having said that, some of the other interesting areas for me are those two other themes that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. So I had um, navigating the end of Moore's Law and the seismic shift around that. I had the transcendence of AI and I had the designing beneficial socio-technical systems. And so those are my three themes. One of them is AI focused, um, AI permeates all of them. But the other two themes, that notion of how, what does it mean to be a beneficial socio-technical system? That has huge implications for uh, the ES Week community. 
um, because you're designing embedded systems that are going to be used in a wide variety of places by a wide variety of people. So how do you support privacy on your embedded systems? How do you think about security on your embedded systems? How do you think about e-waste and sustainability in your embedded systems? These are um, a really set of interest, an interesting set of questions that could fuel a lot of new research in the future. Thank you. Uh, okay, next question is from uh, Nick Dutt. Hi, Margaret, thank you for uh, that talk. Uh, quick question, since we have an international audience, can you speak to some of the international collaborative opportunities uh, from SICE, uh, besides the ones that you had in your slides, uh, for researchers who might want to engage with other uh, colleagues abroad, outside of the U.S., rather? I would be happy to. I'm actually frantically trying to put it into the chat, but I think the chat doesn't go out to everyone. I'm going to put it into the chat. Oh, I'm going to answer it as a, okay. Well, hold on a second. Type answer. You can put it in the chat. I'll make, I'll send it to everyone. I think I just sent it through a, a related question that was out on the Q&A, but I'll also put it in the chat. Uh, so we have a web page of uh, our current slate of international funding uh, opportunities and uh and collaboration opportunities. Um, and there's there's a, there's an awful lot of them. It can be, so on the one hand, it's a rich landscape, great. On the other hand, it can be, frankly, a little confusing. We created the web page just as a coping strategy to be able to kind of track them well um, and to help you track them well. Uh, you can see that we do have, um, uh, a range of countries uh, represented. Some of them, the, the mechanisms differ. So some of them, uh, you come in with your collaborator from, you know, one from the US, one from another country. You write a single proposal together. It goes through a single review process. NSF funds the US researchers and the other countries counterpart to NSF funds on the other side. That's a common mode that we use a lot. We sometimes uh, do what are called supplements where you already have an NSF grant, your colleague in another country has their grant, and there's a supplement mechanism that offers additional funding for you to collaborate, both in terms of perhaps uh, additional um, resources or equipment, but also in terms of travel back and forth if needed, um, now that we're coming out of uh, the virtual world and back to traveling in person. So there's a range and you can see that some of them are topically focused. So for example, um, the Canada one is focused on AI and quantum science. Uh, others are quite broad uh, across all topic areas. So for example, there's a, a, a um, an opportunity between the US and France that is essentially all topic areas. There was an opportunity that got a huge response between US and India collaborations. Um, and we're just getting the, the sort of funding awards out from, from that initial offering. So there's a range of opportunities. It depends a little bit on the mechanisms that are available to us with the different countries. Okay. Nick, you have any follow-up question? No, thank you. I think I see one. Uh, yes. How does size take into account the IPCC recommendations to lower our greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I talked a bit about computing and sustainability, and I talked about this sort of bi-directional pathway. There are so many ways in which computing can play a role in uh, sustainability and greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, so, you know, I. I talked about the program we have on making computing equipment itself more sustainable. That's obviously sort of dead on bullseye for a lot of what we do in a field like embedded systems. Um, but there's also the other half, which is how to um, use computer systems to make communities operate more sustainably. So we have a program called Smart and Connected Communities um, in which we invite proposals uh, that might have to do with um, 
better, more nimble ways to offer public transit in an area using computer or sensing techniques to improve the logistics of such a system. Uh, we have uh, programs in which uh, we're talking about um, computer systems being in support of novel and nimble modeling techniques. So not just, so at different levels, right? There might be long-term climate modeling. There might also be urgent of the moment kinds of uh, modeling exercises in support of maybe urgent needs such as um, incoming storms and trying to understand the storm surges, which have gotten more severe as we have more extreme weather events. So uh, there's a range of ways in which we as a community have relevance to this, and there's a range of size programs uh, that we can uh, sort of respond with. I think one of the things that I hope we'll see over the next five or 10 years, and, and this is basically back out to you as a community, out to ACM and IEEE as the conveners of our community, I hope that we might see a full computing Congress on climate issues, right? What could we do if all of us together uh, came in as a huge set of people worldwide taking this on? It could be extraordinary. So there's what NSF can sort of incentivize or catalyze through our investments, but there's a much bigger and more coordinated effort that could happen if we as the full computing community took this on together. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so again, I want to remind everyone that uh, you can ask the questions just by raising hands, uh, or you can type in your questions in the Q and A. Uh, and we have, uh, fortunately, we have time for a few more questions. So that's a good thing. Let me ask one question. Um, so, I mean, I think a lot of computer systems researchers have been focused on uh, uh, efficiency for so long that uh, maybe uh, the appreciation of the difference between power efficiency or efficiency versus sustainability is still not clear. So what, what really is the difference and why is it so important? So if you, um, there's, a, there's a few vendors actually that uh, have on their website data on the full carbon um, footprint of devices. You can, you can go to, for example, to the Apple website and you can see this. Um, the, the gist of it is that for many of the handheld devices that we carry around with us, laptops, phones, and so forth, the bulk of the embodied sort of environmental cost of those devices is not the energy that they use during their lifetime. It's the energy that's used in designing and manufacturing and fabbing them. Uh, and it's their implications uh, for uh, waste disposal down, down, downstream. And so the idea of uh, our design for sustainability call was to get beyond just focusing on energy efficiency and to view this longer and more holistic set of issues. So that's there. Um, I think you can also think about this in terms, not just the life cycle costs, but you can think about this in terms of things like uh, data centers. Uh, you know, data centers have choices about how they're powered, uh, whether they're powered with, um, you know, sort of quote unquote green energy or more traditional energy sources. And we as users of the internet right now don't have much choice or visibility or agency to, to say, I'm happy to wait a few extra milliseconds, send this to a green data center. We don't have much choice right now. It's not clear what the right user model would be for some of those sustainability choices, um, but there's interesting research to be done in a range of those things. Like, how could you give me a user interface that would let me have a choice? And what choices might we make as a society if we had that? Uh, it, it would be interesting to do the research and find out. So there's an awful lot of work there about, you know, how much does green matter to whom and how can we create new computing ecosystems 
where sustainability is more um, woven into to what they are. Thank you. Uh, let me check if there is any other question. I think I don't see any questions. So I think I will um, say thank you all for your time and attention. I don't uh, know how many different time zones are represented here, but uh, I do see colleagues from all over the world. So it's wonderful that you made time for this. I know for some of you, it probably is getting pretty late. And so I appreciate your time and your attention. And uh, I hope you have a good um, final session of the conference. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Martinsi. Okay, uh, Jurgen. So should we?